The information featured in this program is general in nature and therefore should not be relied upon. Guests appearing on the program may have commercial arrangements with some of the companies mentioned. Before making any investment, insurance or financial planning decisions, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether or not your decision is appropriate for you. Property Investing Matters is brought to you by Destiny, empowering investors to achieve success through property investment for more than 24 years. Hello and welcome to Property Investing Matters. I'm back in the studio and definitely enjoying the ambiance here very, very much. Excited and hoping that the recent lockdown becomes a thing of the past once and for all. I hope you've all stayed safe and you're ready to take on 2022 with a newfound vigour. On the show tonight is Steve Waters from The Right Property Group. And tonight we're looking at a whole raft of things. APRA and how they, they govern lending, what easing restrictions may do to property, mobility, migration, and a federal election, as well as what does the next 12 months look like and will we see a swing back to metropolis living. We also have some of your questions to answer and you can get me any questions of your own to pim at mypropertytv.com.au or you can go to my Facebook page or the My Property TV Facebook page and just pop them in a comment on any of my posts. Now this week the book prize is Investing in the Right Property Now but also a digital copy of How to Succeed in Property Negotiations. So two books up for grab this week. Now to my guest tonight, Steve Wright, oh, Steve Wright, Steve Waters. I think I've made that mistake with Steve before. You need to change your name to Steve Wright, Steve right. Waters from Wright Property Group. Steve has over 17 years of hands-on comprehensive property investment experience and he is himself an accomplished property investor with a substantial property holding. He's a qualified property investment advisor, a professional negotiator, and a licensed real estate in New South Wales, Victoria, Queensland and South Australia. Let's welcome Steve to the show. And you know, Steve, if you did change your name to Steve Wright, it would match your company a whole lot better. I know, it would. I actually remember, I think, my first appearance back in the Your Money, Your Call days. Uh, same thing. It was yeah. Steve Wright. And it was the first show. I was going, oh, no, what, what, who's that? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what I'm remembering. I don't think I've made the mistake since, except for no, just no. then. And, you know, it's in the rundown, right? So you think I could read, but yeah. <laughs> clearly lockdown has impacted on many of my senses. Everybody's. Look, if we've got a lot to talk about today, and I really want to start with APRA. It's in the media again. But before we do talk about what they're doing now, can you just explain to the viewers what APRA is and what they're meant to be doing? Look, in, in very sim simple terms, they're the regulator uh, for the banking industry. And what they've effectively done <clears throat> is they've increased the serviceability uh, rates, if you will, in the back end calculations uh, for loans uh, that the banks need to adhere by. Now, whilst they've increased it by 0.5 of a percent to make it just that little bit harder to get money in terms of serviceability, Everybody's really asking, well, what's the effect? You know, what's the effect to me? What will it do to the markets? And the very short version or very short story, if you will, is that it's done nothing. Uh, half a percent in the scheme of things in terms of serviceability calcs isn't a great deal. So very rough figures. If you could borrow a million dollars yesterday, well, now you're circa 930, 940,000. Uh, yeah, my... My assumption or my guess is that it was a psychological card that they threw on the table to put a bit of hesitation uh, into the market and mm. it's done nothing. Um, Steve, it's not that long since they took the brakes off because they had the brakes on and they had that serviceability rating. And just to explain to viewers what that means in a nutshell is when you apply for a loan, it really doesn't matter what the interest rate is on the loan you're applying for. APRA asks the banks to assess you as if your loan is at 
X interest rate and it's always a little higher than what the current interest rates are. So what that's doing for you is it's building in a little bit of a margin so that if rates do unexpectedly go up, you don't suddenly find that you've borrowed money that you can no longer afford to pay. And for a while that rate was quite high and then they took the brakes off and now they've just touched it up a little again. Steve, I know you say it doesn't have a lot of impact if you're buying a house. But what I found is those investors who have four properties, say five properties and want to go again, it does have a big impact because what it also does is because they're assessing you at that slightly higher interest rate, most banks are also assessing you as if all of your loans are principal and interest, even if they're interest only. And for some people, it can add an imaginary $100,000 a year worth of repayments to their commitments that just aren't there, and it can blow them out of the water in terms of servicing. Yeah, that's a very valid point. It, it, uh, I'm not sure if APRA had that in the back of their mind or were targeting people with three, four, five properties. I think it was a general approach. Uh, and it is all around affordability, as you say, like there's a load, if you will, or a buffer rate that they put on to make sure that you can afford it. But as we all know, there are, there are two types of affordability. There is one what the banks tell you you can afford, and then there is what you really know you can afford. And often they're, they're mismatched. You, know, you take a self-employed person as an example, uh, and they've been capped at a you know, million dollars or whatever it may be, they know that they can afford more. Or conversely, it could be someone saying, well, you, you, know, you can borrow a million dollars, but deep down as the borrower, you know that you could probably only afford $750,000. And it's unfortunate that if we fast forward two, three, five years, it'll be those people that took the money when they deep down knew they couldn't afford it because of their own personal circumstances that we may see on the likes of a current affair and, and what have you. So there's a little bit of, well, there should be a lot, I should say, of self-regulation. Uh, mm. mm -hmm. um, Steve, it's, I think it's really important to talk about and to point out uh, to the viewers, I know that I'm often asked the question, well, why is it that I can go to lender X and borrow this amount and lender Y and borrow so much more or so much less? And I think it's very important to point out that while APRA is providing benchmark rates, it's only for banks. It doesn't apply to non-bank lenders and they can pretty much go with their own uh, serviceability calculators. Yeah, so those uh, NDIs, non-deposit taking institutions, They've been very aggressive in the market over the last 12 months, probably even more aggressive than let's just call it the majors. You, you take you know, one of the largest lenders in Australia, uh, even before APRA was very verbal about what they may do and then what they did do, that particular bank had already started reining in, if you will, uh, via not as being as aggressive in the market. And there was many instances that I saw from clients where that particular bank they could borrow a million dollars, I'm just making this up, but if they went to a, let's call it a second tier lender, they could borrow 1.2. You know, so shop around, have a good mm. broker. Mm. Uh, absolutely, it's critical. Um, and sometimes you might pay a slightly increased interest rate on some of those non-bank lenders, but once you take into account your extra tax deductions and a whole pile of other things, sometimes it can be worth paying that extra to be able to get into a property that might be outpacing that extra by its growth. So a very important um, point to point out there. Um, Steve, easing of restrictions now, we're coming, we've started to come out in New South Wales. Victoria today is Freedom Day. Congratulations to <laughs> Victorians for that. Um, what does it mean for property? Are, are we seeing anything happening already? Yeah, instantly. It, it's interesting. Like if you take, let's just call, we'll start with the Sydney Basin, if you will. Even during these harsh lockdowns, the tempo of the market has been extraordinary. Uh, open homes were more staged, if you will, even though if you might have had steel curtain lockdown LGA areas, those that weren't were still very, very buoyant. With this now freedom slash mobility, uh, the open homes are full, the auction rates are probably fuller. Uh, what I would expect to see is those that 
were holding off putting their properties on the market because of well, who's going to come through my house to to potentially inspect and purchase it. I would expect that even though we didn't have a spring selling season, there's a very good chance that we'll have a summer selling season as those people look to price grab potentially what they deem as the top end of the market. Now that doesn't mean that there's going to be this flourish of uh, extra stock on the market that won't be um, taken up. I think there'll be just as many buyers that come into the market that were potentially waiting off for mobility. So it'll be a, a mute point in terms of prices going down just because of there's, you know, there's extra stock on the market. And mm. APRA, once again, that psychological card uh, for the most won't be too much of an effect. In fact, what it could do is those that, let's call it investors or even homeowners, that could borrow X amount and were looking in that area and now they can't, they'll be looking into the areas that they can afford. And those that's those affordable corridors. Mm. But, at the, but at the top end of town, uh, let's call it the ultra blue chip, very expensive properties. I, I really don't think there's going to be much of that. Every uh, time someone says top end of town, I think of Bill Shorten because it's his favourite saying, the top end of town or the big end of town is his favourite yeah. saying. So I think of some other way to describe that because I don't like thinking about Bill Shorten yeah, when I don't have to. Yeah, um, well, expensive areas of, of Australia. <laughs> um, okay, well, we're not going to get into politics, but let, let's talk about migration now. And there are definitely parts of Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, Adelaide and Perth where migration does definitely have an impact on price growth, we, particularly Melbourne really because Melbourne does seem to get you know a fair amount of inward migration and I'm talking from overseas not from interstate. Mm -hmm. um, are we going to now see that pick up again do you think now that the borders are opening is it going to be delayed will it impact on the markets? It's an interesting question because that all depends on volume if uh, if there's a if the doors open or the gates open and there's a massive throughput of immigration, well, then there'll be a definite effect almost immediately. Uh, but I wouldn't expect, well, if you look at the new Premier of New South Wales, who just last week or early this week said, we're open for business, you know, come one, come all. And the federal government stepped up and said, well, hang on, uh, you don't control international borders, we do. And it was almost just to put a bit of a break on the commentary or the narrative. Uh, but it was very deliberate in, in what the Premier said. He wanted the world to know that they are open to business. Now, call it coincidentally or not, uh, the Victorian Premier very quickly said, well, hang on, we are too, and you know, via some little mechanisms such as you know, the opening of, or sorry, the loosening of uh, lockdowns. The Queensland Government have done something very similar, albeit up until the 17th or thereabouts of December. I think what we're seeing is a jockeying between the state premiers for, to get the lion's share, if they could, of what potentially is large immigration patterns. Because the federal government has also said probably last month or the month before, we need, we need migration, we need immigration and we need lots of it. So if that volume is there, well then I think there'll be an immediate effect. But my mm. guess is it'll be, a, mm. it'll be a, a slow and steady sort of ramp up in terms of those numbers. And it'll probably be led by expats or those that are trapped overseas, followed by potentially students and, and the like, and then we'll start to see a ramp up. But as you as you mentioned, yeah, Melbourne for, for a long time ha held the mantle of the, the winner in terms of the uh, recipient of immigration. And I think they've got a lot to do to repair the damaged reputation around Melbourne. I don't think it'll take too long, but it wouldn't surprise me if we start to see uh, the state premiers potentially offer incentives uh, for people to move to their state. Mm. Unlike state premiers to, you know, disagree and, and battle against each other, isn't it? Like, it's just you never see it. it's unheard of. They're just, they're just normally so polite to each other and they work <laughs> as a team all the time, don't they? Oh, sure. um, <laughs> what about uh, last time you were on the show, which was about three months ago, you and I talked about the fact that people initially all wanted to have a tree change and live in the regions and move out to the regions. But we kind of started to hear rumblings and seen 
potentially people thinking, yeah, well, that didn't work out so well. I think I'll go back to the cities. Is that happening? What are you seeing now? Uh, I'm not seeing much happen in, in the front of people sort of transitioning back to metropolis, let's call it. But I think it will happen. I, I you know, We have the, the whole premise of work from home forever and ever, uh, I don't think is, is sustainable. Uh, but we also must realise that the majority of people of the working force cannot work from home. So those that have moved to a one trick pony town for a sea change, tree change, on the proviso that they're just going to work from home for an ever and ever, I think they're going to have an, you know, a real point in time where there's, they're going to have to make some hard decisions and whether that be they move back to commutable distance to metropolis or whether they quit the, the job and find something locally, which potentially could happen as long as there is jobs. So those regional centres that have multiple income drivers or economy drivers uh, and jobs, well, you know, their sustainability is there. But, but those that don't have the jobs, I think you'll see a trend in the years to come of a movement back uh, to that commutable distance to metropolis. And I say that quite deliberately, commutable distance to metropolis, because if you take the central coast of New South Wales uh, or Sydney, that that's a commutable distance on a blended work environment. Uh, but if you lived in Timbuktu, uh, where it was a three to four hour drive back to you know, Metropolis, well, that may not be sustainable. Yeah, even like Newcastle, you do get people who are ha happily at the moment commuting maybe two days a week to Sydney from Newcastle, but it's still a long, long, train ride and it's it's five yeah. hours a day of your life yeah. on a train which is fine i guess it depends on your domestic situation some people might yeah. want to be away from home for five hours a day it might be a good solution for some um <laughs> we have a looming federal election so let's play the what if game yeah. uh what if liberal gets in again what if it's labor what do you see as happening obviously as briefly as you can in terms of uh, policy that would affect property? That is the big what if game, isn't it? Uh, we saw last election that you know, Labor really tried to, to effectively squash people's entrepreneurial spirit and you know, the people rised up and you know, Liberal, uh, the Liberal Party uh, got government, so to speak. There is a big hole in the federal budget uh, because of clearly what has happened. Um, I'm not sure whether there'll be a tinkering of policy around property uh, to the extreme. Um, so we're really talking about you know, gearing, tax and the like. Uh, but there may be some tinkering just to recoup a little. But the federal government, whether it be Labor or Liberal uh, who, or whomever, yeah, clearly they know that we're in a uh, recovery phase and that the housing industry, real estate industry in totality represents a massive amount of total GDP. And they're not going to play around, I believe, and I might be proved wrong, uh, they're not going to play around too harshly to stall recovery. And just as importantly, the wealth effect between people's ears that is necessary for, for, for people to spend, you know, whether it be white goods, holidays, cars, whatever it may be, so that the economy will uh, spin. So it is a big what if question. I'm not even sure if either party knows what they're going to do at this stage. Mm. I'm not sure if either party should get in, <laughs> to be honest. It's <laughs> like, you know, one of the things that lockdown has done to everybody is it's reduced everybody's faith in politics ridiculously. And even if it's been our state politics that have caused us to now lose trust, lack faith, and just be damned annoyed with politicians for most people that you know that differentiation between federal and, and commonwealth doesn't mean a lot the liberal party is the liberal party the labor party is the labor party and if it's state or federal they either like them or they don't like them so right. i i think okay. everybody's disillusioned yeah i don't think anybody likes them you know I, yeah, I look at myself i'm apolitical i'm more about the policy rather than the party um but that's a whole different discussion maybe a different show Mm. And it's probably a good time for the Australian Marijuana Party to take another tilt because, you know, 
they probably yeah. get a lot more votes this time round. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, you know, that's for medicinal purposes, as an example. Yeah. Now, COVID is, is definitely, uh, it has made people think uh, clearly, and it's been said on the show, you know, a trillion times over, and on any forum for that matter, that you know, it shows you how fickle and unstable realistically people's lives can be with major crises you know whether it's this one whether it was a federal election beforehand APRA had the handbrake the GFC I mean there's always a crisis of some sort every few years mm. I just think this one clearly major and worldwide uh, that it has reshaped the narrative between people's ears and definitely created some sustainable trends uh, but there's also definitely some short-term trends that will disappear into the never-never as people get back to a life of normality. Mm, absolutely. Look, let's go to our last question before we head off to the break. Um, and basically just bringing things a little bit shorter term and the more immediate future, let's say the next 12 months, what do you see happening in property? Um, same, same, but different as the Thai people would say, I, I think the market will continue uh, on its merry way. Now, I'm being quite general. Some will outperform and some will retract a little. Uh, but whilst I say it'll be on its merry way, I definitely think that we'll start to see the rate of growth uh, reduce. And so it should. And as a, you know, as a, an investor, I actually want it to uh, to get back to a degree of normality, if you will. Uh, but there will become a point in time, whether it is in 12 months or, or 24 months or three years, whatever it may be, that it just, the, the, the disparity between purchase price and the, the income that the property produces will make it harder and harder than overlay, uh, I believe, APRA. They'll throw the next card on the table and I'm gonna call it six months. Mm. And I think the disparity between wages and um, house prices, given the fact that wages uh, had, you know, they were slow, they hadn't been growing for a good 10 years. Now, yeah. with companies and businesses, large and small, trying to get back to normality, nobody can afford to give pay rises at the moment. So we are going to see wage growth slow even more, I think, at a time when before COVID hit, it, it, wages were starting to grow again. We'll yeah. see them reduce down again. As I said, no, no one can afford a pay rise. And I think most people aren't going to be asking for one. Um, most people, especially if they're working from home, are feeling the benefits of that and maybe saving money on the commute anyway. Be because of that, if property grows too much more, that gap between income and property prices will be too big for anybody to afford the mortgages for. And I think that will be a natural break on the property market. Correct. The debt, debt to income ratio is really what you're referring to. But because you know, property consumes us, uh, what does me anyways, and, and, and what trends to look out for, because I'm a believer in data is one thing, and as we've spoke about many times, ground truth is another. But often before data is a trend, and trying to identify those trends that are sustainable that translate into data is, is important. The reason I say that is because if we've looked through COVID, if, from the beginning of COVID, people had the ability to, to build these war chests unbeknown to themselves. So there was the mortgage monitorium, you couldn't travel, you couldn't drive, you couldn't eat out, you couldn't go anywhere. And so that disposable income ramped up and the savings were there. Um, and people, when we had that element of freedom early this year, just spent, it went crazy, white goods, cars, boats, um, just not holidays. So it was all locally spent throughout, let's call it Australia or the different regions. Now that there's international travel, now that there's freedom and mobility, there is the real potential that will happen. It's not a potential that will happen that those war chests uh, won't grow at the same rate uh, and they'll probably diminish as well. So there's going to be a real inflection point, I believe, in terms of not just the wage growth, as you mentioned, because that's uh, very important, but there'll also be an element where people just won't have that war chest to spend mm. uh, on different asset classes like they did before. 
Absolutely. Agree entirely. Well, it is time for a short break. Don't go away, though, because when we come back, there's plenty more to come and a lot more of your questions to answer, or at least a lot of your questions to answer. We'll see you soon. Thanks for tuning in this week and catching up with me to get some great property education. Helping me to answer your questions tonight is Steve Waters from The Right Property Group. And you can continue to get your questions to me either for tonight's show or for a future show just by emailing them to me at pim at mypropertytv.com.au or by popping them in a comment or a direct message on my Facebook page. Now let's get to the viewer questions that we have tonight. And the first one comes from Greg. And Greg says, hi, Margaret. I watched the business channel or the business show on the ABC last night. And they pointed out that overseas investors are outbidding Australian buyers. Then the program pointed out that APRA is making it harder for Australians to qualify for loans by raising the loan serviceability percentage test for borrowers. It wouldn't it make more sense if APRA were to make it harder for foreigners and easier for Australians to buy property? Um, yes, I would say the answer to that is yes, Steve, wouldn't you? <laughs> Uh, yes, 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 and yes, but there's you know, nothing against the ABC, but maybe you know, it's a little tilted one way or another. It's a bit dramatic at the best of times. Um, I think there's a bigger story behind it, though, as well. Uh, you know, there's, I get to you know, deal with a lot of different people, as you do, and you know, some of the people that I have as clients are immigration agents, and you know, they're very, very busy. Uh, but some of the stipulations upon people that are wanting to come into the country, you know, they must have multi, multi millions of dollars to do so. And you know, maybe it's a matter of you know, money into the country will be spread throughout. Uh, so I'm sure there's a bigger story than what the ABC is reporting. But the short story is yes. Mm. And look, Greg, I think what we have to be very careful of is the fact that this is a media report. And it's a media report that will be focusing on a number of properties and probably at the big end of town, as Steve says, or the more expensive properties where foreign investors have come in and outbid the local people. But I think if you looked at the percentage of times that that's happening, according to how many properties are sold over a weekend or uh, on any day of the week, it's going to be a fraction. Uh, it makes a good story and I agree with you that they should be focusing on keeping the foreign buyers from outbidding, but I don't think the problem is big enough for it to be addressed. I think if the problem was big enough for it to be addressed, it would definitely be addressed because the last thing anybody wants, particularly the government, is for Australian property to all be owned by foreign investors. We really need to have it owned by Australians. Remember on the other side, on the impost side, foreign investors do have a significant more amount of tax to pay, especially on those higher end properties. Um, and they don't get discounts on things like capital gains tax. There's a whole lot of things that can happen. So I think the problem isn't serious enough at this point for us to worry that all of our properties are being sold offshore. 
but if it started to look like that, I'm, I'm certain that Avra would definitely step in with some kind of strategy for that. Yeah. Um, the next, uh, sorry, Steve? Yeah, just to add one thing to that, like we need to remember too that there's a large chunk of the uh, the, the overseas buyers that aren't there now, and you know, I'm referring to the Chinese buyer, um, when they were in full flight, yeah, that was a, and combined with other uh, countries, yeah, that was definitely a problem and we saw that uh, in the last boom. But as you say, I don't think the problem is as serious enough yet uh, to, you know, to warrant a full-blown investigation or you know, a handbrake on overseas investors uh, you know, from entering the market. Absolutely. Next question comes from Tom. Let's see what Tom has to say. Hi, Margaret. New South Wales government is making changes to the Land Titles Act, including the cancellation of CT, Certificates of Title, and the control of the right to deal framework. And all land dealings must be lodged electronically. This is referred to as 100% e-conveyancing. What are the ramifications? Well, Steve, it's not new. It's been happening in other states for a while now. Mm. Look, I, I just think that's um, that's evolution. You know, that's technology. You know, we, we move forward. The old system was very clunky. Uh, and even if we sort of bring it back to just a day-to-day -day transaction as a purchaser, you know, COVID has, has, has enabled the technology to really work well, whether it's been from docu-signing of contracts, uh, whether it be through walkthrough videos and the like. That's just technology at play. And COVID is definitely uh abled or given the ability you know for us to move forward in certain instances and this is one of them will there be ramifications will there be hurdles will there be breakdowns and issues absolutely whenever a new system is implemented you know there is always teething problems but i'm certainly not concerned about it if anything hopefully it'll be far more efficient mm. Tom, in the olden days, not too long ago, this is how a settlement of property worked where someone owned it with a mortgage and someone was buying it with a mortgage. Um, all of the parties had to agree to meet on the same day. So that would be the solicitors from both sides or the conveyances from both sides and the banks from both sides. And everybody had to be all ready at 2 p.m. on a set day to literally meet together in a room and to be able to hand over a title in return for a check for the bank coming out of the mortgage and the bank going into the mortgage was taking the title and handing over the check to actually buy that property. And it was fraught with issues, things such as security packets being lost. So that meant that the bank who holds those titles when they have a mortgage couldn't find the packet and had to then recreate a title because for some reason they might have moved premises in between and a whole lot of security packets got lost or misplaced. And you know, I recall those days because I've been a mortgage broker since the 90s, since the early 90s, and they were nightmare days where you couldn't get ever a property to settle on the day that it was meant to settle on because something would go wrong somewhere. Now, the minute we know there's a property transaction to take place, the conveyancer lodges it into an electronic system and invites the banks into that space. It's called PEXA. So they invite them into the PEXA space. Now that we have electronic titles, and we've had them in other states for some time now, then it all happens electronically, which is what they mean by 100% e-conveyancing before portions of it could happen by e-conveyancing in that PEXA space. Um, but now everything, including the exchange of title, no more paper titles, nothing lost, all just existing in cyberspace and happening at the switch of a button or the click of a, a keyboard key and much more efficient. Um, and I think if anything, the ramifications is that it's going to bring conveyancing costs down because there's a lot less for everybody to do. Would you agree was, with that, Steve? Yeah, I was just going to mention that it, there's a real potential that it will. You know, there'll be industries that will be born out of this, I'm sure, or, or services. But anyone who hasn't or had not been to an actual settlement uh it was a it was a spectacle you, know, you, you would have thought that it would have been this smooth process but it was just i'd like to say organized chaos but i don't even think that it was organized it was very anticlimactical when you went and saw 
what happened. But it was certainly a vision that I'll never forget. Mm, absolutely, it was it was ridiculous. So it's it's mm -hmm. great to have this. I, I say, bring it on, bring it all on. Absolutely. Next question comes from Anthony. And Anthony says, hi, Margaret. My partner and I have just put a deposit down on an as yet unregistered 3.2 acre lot in a new 26 lot subdivision in the village of East Gresford 2311. Lots had been advertised for all over a year. When we came across them, we jumped on one of the last remaining lots in May 2021, putting down a $1,000 deposit. The total price is 295,000. With acreage prices going through the roof in the surrounding areas of Maitland, Singleton and the Hunter Valley in general, do you think we will see a good return once we build, looking at around 400,000 on an acreage style build. We haven't seen much of similar size available and we feel we are getting a good deal. I guess, uh, Steve, this does feed back to the discussion that we had about commutes, about regional living. Yes. Gresford, it's not quite, um, I mean, it's close to some of the bigger regional areas, but it's not overly big itself. Um, yes. You know, we can't give advice certainly to Anthony because there's something to be said about lifestyle. But if Anthony is expecting to get a huge return out of this, what do you think the chances are? Look, acreage is actually my my specialty. Uh, lived on it all my life. You know, bought, sold, continue to buy acreage. You know, it, but what you need to understand about acreage is, other than the period of time that we've just gone through. Acreage is usually the last thing to go up and the first thing to go down or contract or soften, whichever way uh, that you want to sort of paint it up, if you will. COVID has changed that a little bit. And what we saw with acreage uh, in the beginnings of COVID was everybody, you know, run to the hills, you know, get away from civilization and built up areas and you know, even to the extreme of self-sustaining uh, or sustainability, should I say. Uh, I don't know that area well enough uh, to give any commentary about that, nor should I, you know, whether you'll make a trillion dollars or not. Uh, over time, I think it'll do well. It's that everything does well over time. Um, but just be aware, though, that with acreage living comes acreage costs uh, and you know, the build and check the you know, different types of caveats on the type of what you can build. The fact that you had a, it's not registered yet and you could control it for very little money. Um, you know, people have been very, very successful at that and some people not so successful. Uh, but when you do that, there is an element of speculation that title will register in a given amount of time and that it will value up on title registration. So there are some pitfalls, but generally speaking, you know, it's a good way of living. Mm. I think, Anthony, that's the point. You're obviously buying this for the purpose of living there, for your lifestyle. And nothing beats an acreage lifestyle, particularly if you want to raise a family. I know Steve has a large family, as do I, and I raised my children on acreage as well. In the end, I sold it for a reasonable amount of money, but when I think of everything I put into it over the 16 years that I was there, I got my money back out, but I can't say that it was a fabulous investment. It did grow a little bit, and it enabled me to leverage into other investments. I wouldn't have bought an acreage as an investment though. As an investment, I think there's so much that goes into an acreage and a lot of costs, as Steve says, and unless it can be subdivided in the future, which I'd suggest this one won't be able to be, then to me, an acreage as an investment is a lot of work for potentially not as much return as the same money could get for you if you just bought one or two investment properties in just a suburb somewhere that had families and could be easily bought and sold. One, one Tip, thing, sorry, yep. Mark, one thing I'll add to, uh, to it, Anthony, is that people that have acreage, and I'm one of them, uh, just about every, every February of every year, acreage owners get fed up and we all say you know what we are out of this acreage because the workload in and around february is through the roof you are mowing lawns every day and on acreage that's a lot of lawn uh, so just be aware and i say that a little bit tongue-in-cheek it's a great lifestyle it's great for families um, but in terms of making the big killing in terms of growth as margaret said those types of acreage is, is really more around subdividable uh, stuff but you'll get your inherent growth organic growth uh, and maybe you'll make a bit of money with the build as well. So yeah, good luck to you. 
Yeah, and I think lifestyle is important. I think when it comes to your own home, the investment potential has to be the second thing you think about and your lifestyle and what you're going to enjoy doing once you have your acreage is going to be the most important thing. Um, put it this way, I don't think you're spending too much on it. And I think if you can right. get a build for 400,000 and a buy for 295, you've got a nice round sum there of around 700,000. It's not a bad way to get into a lovely piece of land and a nice quiet lifestyle where if you want to, you never have to meet your neighbours ever, which can be fabulous, Absolutely. trust me. <laughs> Last question for tonight comes from Philip. And Philip says, hi, Margaret and Steve. Talk about a swing back to Metro. Sydney house prices seem to be booming again, apartments included. Do you think that it's real or is it just the press or is it a supply problem? Steve, the interesting thing is when we first started to have the big boom in Sydney and the media was talking it up and talking it up and yeah, prices were going up, it actually took quite a long time to get back to the 2017 peak. So mm -hmm. everybody had this impression that property was booming, but it wasn't, it was recovering. Now it's past the 2017 peak, but if you carve it up, we're just past the 2017 peak, but everybody's thinking that it's this fantastic boom, boom we've had. And yeah, it's been a great run, but it was, we were in recovery for the first part of it. Um, and apartments didn't come along for that ride. So I think apartments are now just starting to, 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 to be the beneficiaries. Yeah, and, and if we go back to the beginning of the, the show and, and what APRA has done and potentially will do again and again, well, affordability comes into play then, doesn't it? And the difference between detached dwellings and attached dwellings, so houses and units, townhouses, the gap has never been bigger than what it is around about today. But what, when the media gives coverage over this, it's very general coverage. I know of units that from day one of uh, COVID, and we bought them, that have grown just as much as uh, houses. You know, they are niche, they are you know, more expensive and in very undersupplied areas that have done extremely well, as good as houses, and will continue to do so. But there are also units that will still be, dare I say, a dog for quite some time. And what I'm referring to there is, and I hope I don't offend anybody, but is that investment stock, as an example, we talk about Sydney in and around Zetlin, where the sun never shines, uh, poor building quality and, and the like. Yeah, they're gonna take a long time to, to to recover, and I'd suggest that it's going to need a lot of overseas buyers uh, to really help that market. But there is a big gap. Affordability will pay will play a key, but so too will immigration. Uh, when when we have those large amounts of uh, people that are coming into the country, I'd imagine that you'd start to see that supply uh, start to you know, get sucked up. Mm. And, and Philip, I think both Sydney, Melbourne, and Brisbane, or all three did have a supply problem with um, Melbourne had the most significant supply problem as in an oversupply. Brisbane came next and then Sydney had a, an oversupply problem of its own. And I think we are just starting to see that oversupply problem work its way out a little. Initially as well, that supply problem was compounded with the fact that all of the uh, building defects that were being uncovered made people very, very leery of apartments for a little while. So people weren't buying them because they were worried that they'd buy something that had the much publicised problems that we saw um, out at Homebush and in various other buildings that really had big, big problems. So we're just starting to see some of that supply work its way out now, which means that if supply's down a little, it's just the natural market now that's happening with apartments now starting to get a little bit more interest and they're starting to change hands for a little bit more. Um, I don't see a big boom coming for apartments anywhere for just now, we still have supply to work out, particularly in Melbourne. Melbourne's got millions of other problems to work out as well. So I, I think um, if the swing comes back to Metro, it's probably not going to be necessarily in the apartment market. It's more going to be in house, the house apartment. And I think as Steve pointed out before, in those more affordable corridors where people are worried that they'll be locked down again and they don't want to be locked down without a backyard, I think, has put demand pretty 
firmly on houses. So. Well, we have run out of time this week, but we will be back again. And you can also catch past shows on the My Property TV website or by going to destinylive.com.au and getting a free account. And there you can watch as many past shows as you like, as well as anything that I've ever recorded for the past 20 odd years is all up there in Destiny Live. Great educational resource there. Now, if we answered your question tonight, make sure that you claim your prize by emailing pim at mypropertytv.com.au with the subject book prize. Tell me your name, address, and which question you ask, and your books will be on their way to you. Thank you to Steve Waters for being with me tonight. As always, it's great to have his wisdom and insights. Thanks so much, Steve, for being here. Pleasure, pleasure as always, Margaret. Getting toward Christmas, but hopefully you'll come back again next year. I've just said that, so you have to now. Right. <laughs> I've said it on air. <laughs> it's there. <Yeah. laughs> I can be contacted via social media or email directly to pim at mypropertytv.com.au or even a message on any of my socials. Remember too that there's a lot of free educational stuff on my website, destiny.com.au, vidcast, podcast and the answer to pretty much any question that you'll ever have about property investing, and it's all free. Just pop over to the website and you'll find it there. Have a great week, and I'll see you back here again next episode. Property Investing Matters was brought to you by Destiny, empowering investors to achieve success through property investment for more than 24 years. Hello there, I'm Margaret Lomas. You might remember me from my Sky News Business Property Show days. My company is Destiny and we've taken the 25 years experience that we have in property advising and created Property Match. For the first time anywhere, now you can be matched with the investment property most suited to you. Give us a call today or visit the website mypropertymatch.com.au. Why not leave it to the people who know property investing the best, Destiny. You can teach me your game with no reasons.